Are you too focused on what your life should look like instead of focusing on how your life actually feels? Welcome to the Search for Serotonin podcast, a podcast all about letting go of what you thought your life would look like and embracing your life for exactly what it is. Hi, I'm Carolyn, and this podcast is my audio diary where I share the struggles of being in your 20s, what going to therapy really looks like, and what it's like to live with severe high-functioning anxiety, clinical depression, and perfectionism. We all battle our own demons, but we shouldn't feel alone because of it. If you feel like you're not good enough or that you're behind in life, then let's start searching for serotonin together. Welcome to the search committee. Welcome back, Search Committee members, to another episode of the Search for Serotonin podcast. This is your host, Carolyn Farrick, and today I am joined by a very special guest who I talk about a lot on the podcast. You guys have definitely heard me say her name before, Um, but today I am joined by Helen Ferguson, a specialist trauma therapist who focuses on childhood trauma and sexual abuse recovery. And today I'm going to be talking to Helen about sexual abuse, some of the symptoms that people who experience sexual abuse experience after the fact, and maybe just a few ways on how, if you out there are struggling with getting over sexual abuse or sexual assault, how you can hopefully find peace, recover from this incident, and just get back to yourself. So Helen, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. And thank you for joining me for another episode because you've already been here to talk about self-compassion, but today we're taking it a little bit heavier. So thank you for joining. Oh, it's, it's fantastic to be here again with you. I love talking to you. Um, I love that we, you know, that we've had these conversations before, but we're bringing it to, to this platform to be able to you know, share, you know, a very difficult subject and talk about a very difficult subject, but one that shouldn't hide in the shadows because it's, it. we need to have these conversations to inspire others to feel that they can share their story. Um, so to come back in today and have this conversation is, is fantastic. And thank you for inviting me and thank you for dropping my name Uh, I didn't realize that that my name has been bandied around a bit but uh, no thank you for doing that it's 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 nice to know I'm (laughs) semi-famous yes 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 in 2022 you know I did have a lot of guests on the podcast and I always try in other episodes whenever you know self-compassion pops up I always say you know well I did an episode with Helen and go check out Helen like I never have enough good things to say about you so I am a big fan of you and when I first started opening up about my own sexual assault experience on the podcast this past year that was probably one of the biggest things I think I did on this podcast was finally work up the courage and the ability to kind of put this out into the world and say, hey, this is something that happened to me. And that's actually why I wanted to have you on today, because, you know, I want to take it one step further. I don't want to just make it about me. I want to extend it out to my listeners and help people out there who may be going through the same thing. And like you said, we need to have these conversations. We need to, you know, help people feel seen and heard and able to acknowledge these things and work through these things. So I'm excited for what we're going to get into. Perfect. Me too. I am too. Awesome. All right. So Helen, um, let's just talk a little bit about sexual assault. You know, um, something that I was very kind of uncomfortable about when I experienced my own sexual assault is that I didn't really want to speak up or acknowledge it or tell anybody anything had happened. And I didn't speak up about it for weeks after it did occur because I didn't think it was, you know, bad enough or that anybody would believe me. And I know a lot of people let those kind of stereotypes and preconceived notions of, well, no one's going to believe me anyway, so why speak up about it? It's not even that bad. Um, Kind of what does sexual assault look like? So maybe if people are experiencing things out there and they're just kind of sweeping them under the rug, maybe we can help bring those things to light for them. And it's, it's it's certainly an interesting place to start because um one of the things that's hugely important is to under- is to acknowledge that there's sexual abuse and acknowledge that there's sexual assault but they come under the um- umbrella of sexual trauma um so you don't have to have had a penetrative sexual abuse um or sexual assault 
for it to be sexual trauma. You know, it's anything, you know, you can, um, it can be a touch. It can be words that are said to you and ways in which those words have been said to you. It can be, um, it can be like, um, for example, like a sexual stalking, you know, those kind of things where, and a sexual kind of bullying, but sexual, you know, elements, very different elements that, that are, that come under the umbrella of sexual trauma. Now, sexual abuse is, is, you know, we think of as, as different. It, we think of it in terms of the grooming aspect, the, um, certainly kind of in childhood teens early early adulthood but also within within a relationship there's there can be sexual abuse and sexual assault so they they overlap with each other but they come under the umbrella of sexual trauma so anything that has 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 actually made you feel sexually uncomfortable can come under that sexual assault and sexual trauma I had one lady that was working with me a couple of years ago now um, that she was saying to me, it wasn't, it wasn't anything that was physically done to me, but there was this sexual undertone to the way that my father was speaking to me that, that made me feel that there was this threat of sexual intent. That's sexual assault that's sexual trauma. And so even those things, I mean, there were particular words, there were particular ways in which these words were said. Um, there was the threat of something coming. So if you feel that threat, that, that you are sexually under threat and it, at, at whatever level, it's a sexual trauma. I hope that makes sense. It's quite, it's quite difficult to define all aspects. Um, even there was a, there was an, another lady that was working with me that you know that it was her husband and and it was rape you know and um she she said but he's my husband and i said it doesn't matter whether he's your husband or not you didn't want it therefore it's rape mm-hmm. therefore it's sexual assault so any, any you know anything of a sexual nature verbal touch penetrative in any way um anything a sexual stalking anything that makes you feel sexually at risk sexually vulnerable your body then and you as a person then then that's a sexual trauma yeah and that definitely makes sense and I think it's so important that you you know framed it in that way and let people know it doesn't even have to be you know anything physical it can be a look a way something said it can be you know just like the feeling that you get like if you you know like that gut feeling of oh this isn't right or this is you know too far this is crossed a line and in my experience I was just kind of that like triggered something in me is because in my experience I was raped and it was a friend and it was a coworker and it was somebody I thought that I trusted. And even at that level, you know, I was like, I'm not telling anyone it happened because who's going to believe me and, you know, nothing's going to like change either way. I can try and fight this, but you know, no one's going to believe me. No one's going to hear me. And it was that fear and that shame. So then you saying, you know, oh, well, the way someone says something to you, you know, women take their actual physical rape cases to court and the abuser walks free and the rapist walks free. So like thinking of that level of just like, oh, someone said something to me, you know, it's just thinking, well, how is anybody going to believe that if they're not believing like the physical evidence? So I think it's important to let women know that, you know, even though that other people might not see it that way. That's the actual way that Mm -hmm. sexual assault is defined. And people can tell you no, no, and people can't believe you, but that's the truth. And so reminding women that like, if that's your experience, then that qualifies. It qualifies. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing, for sharing your, your story. You know, it's, it's a, it's very impactful. And I'm sorry that you went through that. Um, You know, it's, it is the battle I think that we have that you know in terms of courts and in terms of um, in terms of prosecution. 
around sexual abuse and rape and trauma and sexual trauma and sexual assault, you know, we have an uphill battle and we've got a long way to go. Um, you know, certainly even even in my work with children who've been sexually abused, you know, it's it, it which is you know a it's a fragment of my work. It's it's not a it, it's not a big portion now, but it's a fragment of my work. Um, that you know even even taking that through a court process, you know, you you you've got no sense of whether you know a prosecution you know and a and a judgment will be made in your favor it's it's you know and that that's horrendous and i think that that certainly is what stops people from feeling able to say what's happened to them um because you know on that level it's it's like well if i'm not going to believe and i'm going to be torn apart in court then then why would i put myself through that when there's no guarantees and it's almost you know it's the level of the level of proof um which is very difficult to to especially when it's words when it's ways and it's it's the way that somebody's spoken to you it's the way that somebody has behaved towards you that has not been rape or an actual physical kind of uh, assault um or a, a physical sexual abuse you know, trying to prove those things um, and its effect on you in a court process is very, very difficult. Um, and I and I wish it weren't. I wish we could change that. And I, th I, you know, I think it may not be in my lifetime. I mean, I'm, you know, approaching 50 now, so it may not be in my lifetime that that, that happens, but I hope it is because some things do need to change around that. We have seen significant movement around that in the last few years, but not enough. Yeah. Yeah. And like, thank you for mentioning that too, because one of my biggest regrets is not coming forward and not fighting it. And I, once I did open up to people and I leaned on people and I trusted people with this information, they wanted to fight more than I wanted to fight. But I was like, no, 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 no. I can't do that because at the time, you know, I wasn't acknowledging my own mental health. I had so much unhealed trauma. I was a mess myself. I couldn't take anymore. I couldn't even take care of myself to begin with, let alone fight in court. And like the guy had drugged me and I didn't come out for weeks after. And I didn't go to the hospital the next morning to get a rape kit. And I've watched enough like Law and Order SVU to know like if you don't get that, like it makes it 10 times harder to you know, prove anything or make a case. And so then it's all just like speculation. Like you said, it's it's hard to prove it. It's so difficult to prove it. And I think that's what deters a lot of women because after, and any men in general, if anyone goes through sexual assault, you know, after experiencing that, you don't trust yourself. You don't trust anybody. You feel so just like detached and emotionless and scared and helpless that exposing yourself to one of the most traumatic things that's ever happened in a courtroom in front of strangers, in front of people who want to like shame you even further for that. Like it's so much to take on. So when people say, well, why didn't you speak up? You know, why didn't you do anything? It's not that simple really. No, no. And I'm, and I'm really glad that you, that you, I'm going to say, I'm really glad that you mentioned the law and order thing. You know, one of the things that I think, you know, is, is hugely important to understand is that when something like that has happened to you, yes, there's a very rational and logical thing that you, in 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 moments of clarity, you will go, yes, that's what I need to do. But we have to remember that what also happens is that when something has happened to you that that is a sexual trauma, sexual abuse, sexual assault, is that you go into what I'm going to describe as a paralysis. OK, mm -hmm. so your your body, your mind goes into your whole nervous system, your whole autonomic and central nervous system goes into a paralysis in order to just survive. Yeah. The best thing that you're going to be able to do is think rationally mm -hmm. about this has happened to me. What do I need to do now? Actually, what you what your body and your mind and your whole nervous system goes into is how do I just survive this moment? And so that that is why it's so difficult then to to 
because in in that moment of paralysis, I'm going to keep on using the word paralysis. I think it's it's an important one. It's an emotional and psychological and 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 physiological paralysis that happens because you have just experienced something that oh, that no one should ever experience. Mm-hmm. And and so you're it's a shock to the system. It's a shock paralysis. So you're not going to think rationally in that moment. You're not going to think, right, the 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 guidebook is the one um on this tells me to do this, 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 this. I should phone the police now and say this, this, this. I should take myself to hospital and have a regular. There are some women that I know that have and and men actually that have managed to do that, but that's almost like the shock system has has taken them into that moment. But in the most part, we don't do that. As human beings, we don't do that. We don't think rationally in that moment. We think this paralysis, we go into shock and and we just have to survive in that half an hour, an hour, three hours, 24 hours, 48 hours later. And only then sometimes can can women and men and anybody that's experienced this start to, to come through and think, what do I do now? And unfortunately what has happened then is the shame has kicked in. If I hadn't have been doing this, would this have happened? If I hadn't have been if I hadn't been wearing this, would this have happened? If I hadn't have had a couple of drinks, if I hadn't, if I hadn't have been, you know, if I hadn't have been perhaps a bit flirtatious, you know, then this wouldn't have happened. It was, you know, if, if, so the blame, the blame game starts happening. And that, that's the underpinning then of shame. Mm -hmm. So the blame of, If I'd have just not been me, then this wouldn't have happened. And the shame then of having to go and share something to a complete stranger that is so intimate on any level, whether it's whether it's verbal, whether it's it's touch, whether it's penetrative, anything, it's still intimate. It's still it's still an intimate attack on us to explain that to anyone you know it is extraordinarily difficult where are the words for that where are the words you know so yes there's the there's the rational you know there's the rational in the day-to-day well why didn't you think of doing this 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 you can't because your body and your mind have gone into just keeping you alive yeah, and I'm I'm so glad that you said all of that because that really sums up what I experienced too because I woke up the you know morning after everything happened I was alone and my mind didn't even think oh my god what just happened to you I woke up and I was like shit I'm late for work I need to figure out how I have to get to work like I need to go 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 and this man like drugged me so I was still like fully like drugged out but I was like I have to go to work I have a shift like uh, you know it's not even like holy shit take a minute who gives a shit about the job that you have right now like what just happened to you it was like no go to work rush to work like get through the day survive and I got to work and all of my like coworkers and friends were like what the hell is wrong with you what's going on and I'm like oh I'm fine I just drank too much last night you know everything's great and like worked an entire day worked a whole shift and then was back out at the bar with everybody that next night and like pretended like nothing even happened like it wasn't even like a thought in my mind to register like whoa like what just happened was not okay it was just like go through the motions make sure everyone sees that you're like thriving and then like you said that shame kicks in it's like well, maybe if I didn't go to the bar that night, or maybe if I didn't send that text. So all of those what ifs, and then you start to think, like you said, well, if I wasn't me, if there was something different about me, 
And that's stuff that I've really held on to the last four years. And I'm sure if people out there listening have been through similar things, the first place, instead of rationality, the first place most people's minds go is to let me attack myself. Let me put myself down. Let me blame me for not being, you know, capable enough or well aware enough or prepared enough or whatever it may be. And so I think it's really important that people hear, you know, shame is a normal response, you know, all of that kind of stuff is normal. So what are some common after effects aside from shame that people experience after going through sexual trauma? What kind of symptoms or things will they start to display or go through? I mean, it's it, it's fairly unique to each and every one of us, but um, and each and every one of any of you listeners, but um, you know, some of the common threads. Obviously, shame is the most significant. It's mm-hmm. the one that is the most um compounding uh so when you experience that shame that that then influences your self-esteem your self-worth how you how you understand yourself um how you think about yourself so you'll see a deterioration in you know in your self-esteem your self-worth the belief that you have in yourself and your abilities as well you'll you there'll be a you'll see a disconnection between yourself and other people that because of that shame so it will disconnect you from um friends colleagues you know um life sometimes the whole of life so a distancing a real sense of loss of that connection that you have with people obviously some of the the other ones are around anxiety high levels of stress depression um and symptoms that are associated with PTSD and 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 CPTSD if it's if CPTSD, CPTSD if it's been a recurring um, experience. So PTSD is the standalone. CPTSD is the is the complexity where it's been recurring. So that's the simple way of describing it. There's a more complex way. <laughs> um, so you'll see those things and they, you know, you might have experienced kind of suicidal ideation. So some suicidal thinking without the intent, you know, so there is a difference between the suicidal ideation and the intent to cause yourself um, harm enough to die. Uh, but suicidal ideation is a, is a prominent one and, and self-harm um, self-harming behaviors. And some of those self-harming behaviors don't necessarily need to be, like cutting yourself, but but they can be an increase in drinking, um, you know, in, an increase in smoking, you know, taking some non-prescription drugs as well, you know, some of those real sabotaging behaviors, you know, eating more, eating less. We see more eating disorders in people that have um, that have experienced sexual abuse and sexual trauma, um, because what you do is you start to attack yourself, um, because because of the shame so you start to attack yourself and so I I often see people that you know have linked into these self-sabotaging and self-harming behaviors in some ways to try and make themselves less attractive as well so if I wasn't this attractive and I, I was overweight then people wouldn't have done this to me equally you know the 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 other end of the scale in terms of anorexia and and reducing eating has the same effect if i wasn't a, attractive then this wouldn't have happened to me so there's this self self attacking behavior that happens due to the shame and that's why it's so difficult to work with that because you know because it it can become very entrenched so I've worked with, I mean, I work with some men, but predominantly work with, with women and and um, and anyone who identifies as a woman, I should say, as well. So, you know, um, the, you know, I've worked with women who have had a sexual trauma in their teens, in their childhood, in in their early adulthood, and they come to me when they're mid forties only then being able to say what has, what's happened to them that was 20, 30 years ago. Um, so it's, it, you know, it, 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 it's a very, very um, complex, actually, it's, it's very complex effect that it has on people um, because you can then, a bit like you, you, you then 
dive into just trying to get through everyday life and appearing normal because you don't want to think about what's happened you mm -hmm. don't want to feel what's happened um because it's so horrid for you um that then you throw yourself into appear kind of oh everything's normal everything's fine that didn't happen because you want your life back and and then there's something and especially with some of the women that I work with there's something that happens later on in life that's like Oh, hang on, no, I'm feeling it. And so you, you may experience flashbacks. Um, you may experience um and flashbacks and, and and triggers that bring sensory flashbacks as well, not just um uh, not just uh, psychological ones, but sensory mm -hmm. So a, a, a smell, a touch, somebody, you know, it might be an aftershave, might be a, a flower, um, it might be anything like that that brings a sensory memory into your body of what happened to you yeah I there's so much there's so many points here that you made that I'm like oh I want to touch on this but speaking to the sensory piece you know like I a box fan for me and like yeah. actually the first year after I went through this I had a PTSD attack I had a 45 minute panic attack and I later found out I was suffering from PTSD and I was like that's not right like that's that doesn't make any sense but like you said it's uh, something that can result as an aftermath of what happened and I said four years ago this happened to me this past year was the first year that I didn't have some sort of physical reaction. I didn't cry. My body didn't feel it. I didn't have flashbacks. So for three years after, you know, every year on that day, I would feel it. I would cry. I would have this like, you know, sense in my body that I carried with me and I felt for so long. And so it's, it's not just like, you know, one and done, you get like, you know, just a few, like, thoughts about it and then you can forget about it it like stays in your body like any other trauma like you really carry it um and then another thing I did want to touch on was how you say some people can increase drinking or doing drugs or eating or not eating and something that I've worked on with my therapist she likes to refer to it as numbing <laughs> and I'm trying to pull myself out of the numbing because when I first experienced it you know I was drinking all the time I was like you're never eating you don't have money to eat and I kind of pushed myself onto the way of like you know more anorexia because I was like you don't deserve to eat you know yes. just drink and numb out the pain like you don't need to like basically feel yourself and care about your body because you want to die anyway you are you're already dead so just numb it out with alcohol and smoke a bunch of weed and make yourself feel you know less in all of this you know, all of that is about not feeling. Um, and one of the things I always, you know, talk about is the fact that when you when you begin to heal, when you want to heal, when you feel able to heal, everybody wants to heal. But um, when you feel able to, when you feel that you that you can, um, one of the most difficult things is is feeling your emotions. Um, because all of those self-attacking, self-sabotaging behaviors are about not feeling on a sensory and emotional and psychological level, not, not feeling your emotions because trauma, like you say, it's in your body. It's at a very cellular level. Um, so you will feel it in all aspects of yourself. So, you know, there are things that you might not necessarily notice that you're doing um, that are about you suppressing those feelings, suppressing those emotions, because when you feel them, you think that you're going to be taken back to that place. And actually, when you begin to heal from trauma, from any trauma, when you start to, to notice and respond and actually feel your emotions, then you are able to begin to start having some mastery over them so that you feel that you've got some control. And the self-sabotage, I don't really like the word. It's it, Self-sabotage is not a, a, a phrase that I particularly like. Um, I think it, they're kind of almost self-managing, um, but they come from a place of trauma. One of the questions I did want to ask you is about perfectionism as a trauma response. Because I got diagnosed with OCPD a year after my rape occurred, and perfectionism is one of the main symptoms of OCPD. Well, I feel like I've always struggled with OCPD and it's something that I got from childhood and things that I've gone through. I feel like the perfectionism aspect was really intensified as a response to the sexual assault because 
I wanted to have control. I thought if I could make my life look perfect, if I could make life feel perfect, if I could put all of the pieces in their little places, then it would make the pain and the shame less prominent when that really wasn't the case. Um, so do we want to talk about how perfectionism can be a trauma response and what that kind of looks like as a trauma response? I think absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things I see a lot on online at the moment about perfectionism yeah. being a, a trauma response. And what I want to say is that think about it in terms of the response to trauma is the shame and the physical, you know, the, the central nervous system, the autonomic the, the um, response to trauma. What happens then is a set of habits and behaviors that manifest themselves in order to try and manage that response. So in order for you to try and manage the response of shame of I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm a failure, I'm this, I'm that, you know, all those kind of, you know, the I am's of the, the negative kind of I am's of, of, uh, that, that are linked with shame. What happens is a manifestation of, of behavior like perfectionism in order to manage that response so that you try not to feel it. But actually it has a very paradoxical effect because perfectionism doesn't exist. Being perfect doesn't exist. So you're then trying to attain to something and trying to achieve something that you're never gonna achieve. So you're reaching for a star that you're never going to get grab hold of. And then the, obviously the, the kind of the, the effect of that is that increases your shame because you then prove thing that you're not good enough yep. because you've not reached perfection. So it's that, you know, and I, there was a great psychologist and I can't remember, um, I can't remember his name now. It, it, uh, it, it escapes me um, that you know, I remember kind of from 20, 20, I mean, I've been doing this now for 24 years, so it would have been kind of in the early parts of that. That it turned around in a conference that I was at and said, you know, perfectionism is fear in a fur coat. It's, you know, it's dressed up, you know? Yes. Uh... So when you're reaching, when you've, where your perfectionism, your need for perfectionism that you're never going to achieve um, is based solely it's your fear showing up and it's your fear and it's your shame of I'm not good enough I'm not worthy but hang on I'm going to try and prove it by being perfect yeah oh shit I'm not perfect oh then I must be a failure I must not be worthy I must not be good enough so you end up in that cycle it's that shame cycle okay so trauma in its perfectionism is in 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 itself is not a direct trauma response it you know so i i've experienced trauma therefore i will be a perfectionist um it's i've experienced trauma i i, I feel this shame that i'm not good enough i'm not worthy i'm not i'm i'm bad i must have i it must be me i am the per, i am the person that made this happen um I must show, I must prove that I'm not by being this, by trying to be this perfection, perfect, perf perfect person, by doing every, trying to do everything perfectly. And then, oh, I can't do it perfectly because it doesn't exist because it's fear in a fur coat. And, and therefore it's proved, you know, it proves that I'm not worthy and I'm not good enough. So I always talk to my clients about just, it's a bit more harder than this, but I, I kind of say to them, we don't, we, 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 in therapy, in client therapy work, I say to them, we're, hang on, we're just going to, you know, we're just going to leave the perfectionism to one side because actually we're not going to work on that. What we're going to work on is the fear that's behind the perfectionism. And that's what people struggle with, you know, because I, I get a lot of women because I work with it. I actually have a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business women, and I actually have a lot of therapists come to me for for therapy. So um, because we're all human. <laughs> we all, yes, we all. It doesn't matter whether you're you know, the best therapist in the world. 
there will have been things that happen have happened to you and therefore you might need therapists. So I I actually I I, I don't know whether I need the tagline the therapist for therapists. Um, <laughs> but um yes, but you know and there's this this need this you know I've got to be perfect I've got to be this and I'm I'm like no 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 because that's not going to happen. I'm I'm always kind of a, a truth bomb kind of person. But it's not going to happen. What you're trying to achieve is a sense of self that is valid, that is that is one of worth, that is one of respect and dignity and confidence and compassion and anything else that you're empowered, you know, and anything else that you that has made because your trauma, because your sexual trauma, because your sexual abuse has made you feel that you're not any of those things. Strip, shame strips your dignity shame strips your self-respect it's stripped you know it because especially when it comes from trauma and so we don't work on trying to hone the perfectionism we understand what the fear is and we bring dignity and respect and worth back to yourself from yourself so let's talk a little bit about how self-compassion and compassion in general can tie into this and kind of what role that can play in the healing process. Self-compassion is is the, the very foundation of healing and recovery um, because with shame, you you tend not to have any compassion for yourself because you're blaming yourself. So if we talk about self-compassion and compassion as slight, you know, as two, so there's the self-compassion towards yourself. Um, you can have compassion for other people. We are hardwired for compassion, by the way. It's in our mammalian brain. So it's, we are hardwired for it. What we find difficult is turning that inwards to ourselves. And so when something has happened to us, like sexual abuse, sexual trauma, you know, sexual assault, because of the shame that comes, that sets in, we lose the compassion for ourselves. We may still be able to show it towards other people who have experienced something similar or who haven't. You know, we might still, you know, we, we will still have compassion for our friends. Um, but then, you know, turning that inwards towards yourself feels excruciatingly painful because you are entrenched in shame and blame. And so when you are beginning a healing journey in recovery, you can't reach recovery and healing without bringing compassion to yourself and your and what you experienced and the pain that you experienced and the emotions that you experienced from that. So what with self-compassion, what, what, what you do is, and it is very hard for people, it's shifting out of that criticism that criticism of, you know, if I had been somebody different, then this wouldn't have happened. If I had been less pretty, if I had been less less masculine, if I had been, you know, less provocative or flirty or anything like that. Provocative gets a, you know, a lot of people, you know, think about it as a as a as a derogatory term. But actually, you can be provocative and flirty, but not, you know, and you have a right to be that, you know. Um, so what happens is you you know you you turn you you when you bring self compassion when you connect in with your self compassion you start to think about yourself differently you start to think about yourself and talk to yourself and respond to your emotions and your feelings with with the with compassion with dignity with respect with love and and so what then happens is you're able to bring a, a self-acceptance and, and into into the relationship with yourself the acceptance that this painful thing has happened to you but the acceptance that it wasn't your fault that the, the it was nothing that you did that made somebody else choose to do this thing to you whatever that thing is so self-compassion brings you to a place of self-acceptance and with self-acceptance, you are able to flourish as the self that you are, this vibrant, natural, wonderful human being that you are, that isn't shrouded by the shame and the pain of your experience. A valuable thing to acknowledge is that 
is actually the only person that you need to forgive is yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Because blame is, is, is what you need to forgive yourself for. And that's also not easy to do. That takes a lot of time and a lot of work. Yeah, it does. And it takes a lot of self-compassion. Yeah. 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 Cause like, you don't have to live You don't have to experience that person ever again. You don't have to interact with that person ever again. You don't, like you said, you don't have to forgive that person. I don't forgive that person for anything, but you have to find a way to make peace with yourself, forgive yourself and get to a point where you can live with yourself every single day and not bully yourself over something that you really didn't have any control over. But never ever put yourself to a time scale or time frame of healing and recovery healing is a journey it's not a destination recovery is what you want the recovery of yourself the recovery of who you are the recovery of the person that you want to be and want to become into your future it's different for everybody you know you can take as long as you need you take whatever time you need. You know, you can't just snap your fingers and be fixed. And I know sometimes people have that ideation. So if anyone out there is been going through it for a while to, you know, don't beat yourself up. It, it takes time and there's nothing wrong with you essentially for taking the time you need. Exactly that. Exactly that. There is nothing wrong with you for taking the time that you need to mm-hmm. recover and heal you know, because it's unique to you, what your experience is unique to you, you, the way that you, uh, you, the way that you respond to it is unique to you. And therefore your recovery and healing from it is unique to you. It doesn't mean that you're going to be in therapy for the rest of your life, but you know, it does mean that it may take a bit longer than, than you think, or it may take longer than somebody else who said to you, well, I was in therapy for, you know, four months and I'm great now, you know, That's, you know, don't measure yourself against other people. Just acknowledge what you need for you and how you want to, how you want to do that. And, and actually seeking the right person to help you with that and make sure absolutely, please, this is a big, big thing for me right now. Please, please make sure that they're qualified. Have a conversation with the person. I always, you know, I I say to people, ask me anything, you know, ask me anything about my training, ask me anything about my clinical expertise. I will, I will be, you know, I'm an open book. Um, but absolutely just make sure, you know, that that person is qualified because the last thing you need is somebody opening up your, your pain, um, and not being able to help you with that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that because that is also very important for people to hear. So one last quick question. Um, just what are some quick pieces of advice that you could give to those who are maybe stuck in the cycle of self-judgment and self-criticism? What are some things that you would recommend to help them get to a place of forgiveness and self-compassion so then they can kind of start on their own healing journey? The first thing is is to be able to start sharing your story what's happened to you you know the sooner that you not the sooner that that sounds like I'm pressurizing you into doing it now but when you are able to share your story you start to shift shame because shame doesn't have a place in when you start sharing a story when you start sharing what's happened to you but always make sure that you feel safe with the person that you're going to share that that with okay so you know, it can be a it can be a colleague, it can be a partner, it can be a, a, a close friend, but somebody that makes you feel safe. Because once you start sharing your story, you start releasing it. It's not stuck inside you. Um, start. I would also say, you know, because you're what when you feel stuck you, in shame, you start to feel less empowered. Actually, also look at some empowering things that you can do for yourself. You know, if it's if it's you know and I don't mean necessarily you know massive things but even just you know if you if you've not ridden a bike for a while you know go out on a bike ride it's an empowering choice you start to shift the power and empowerment so that you you get to choose to do things that are aligned with who you are so sharing your story safely 
choosing to do things that are empowering for you. Also really looking at who your safe circle of trusted friends are you, and, net, and keep them in your network. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I fully believe in all of that. That is important. That's what helped me get started on this journey. So Helen, thank you so much for being a part of the Search for Serotonin podcast yet again. Thank you for having this conversation with me. I know it is a very sensitive and, you know, sometimes uncomfortable subject for people to talk about, but I'm so glad that we could shed light on this and I wouldn't have wanted to have this conversation with anybody but you. Oh, bless you. Thank you so much for having me. That is all for this week's episode with Helen Ferguson. Zoom is annoying and I refuse to pay for the upgraded version. So Helen and I kept getting kicked off. So that's kind of why we had to end a little bit abruptly. And her and I had been talking for so long anyway that I could not possibly take up any more of her time. So once again, I would like to thank Helen for being a part of this podcast. She always brings so much value. I love having her on the podcast because not only does she help me so much, but I really hope you guys get a lot out of these conversations that I have with her as well. She is such a great energy, such a great person, and I just can't thank her enough for everything that she does and the person that she is. If you want to go check out Helen on social media or go find her website, I have tagged everywhere you can find her down below in the show notes. So go show Helen some love because she deserves it. And if you resonated with anything that we talked about in this episode today, I'm sure you could benefit from following her socials and seeing the kind of content that she puts out. All right, you guys, thank you so much for another episode of the Search for Serotonin podcast. It was a little bit personal this week, but I hope, hope, hope that it helped somebody out there who may be dealing with some of the same things. Have a wonderful Monday and a wonderful week, and I will see you back here next time for another episode of the Search for Serotonin podcast. Love you guys. Always remember this world is better with you in it.